here is the thing about community property. And I want you to think of it as good news. Community property is largely statutory, is well settled, all right? The bottom line is it's all rule-based. There's very, there's some, but there's not many of the balancing fairness, that kind of stuff. With community property, you can say, if X, then Y. If A, then B. Therefore, C. In other words, you work your way down to a path to come to a conclusion. The not so good news is that your conclusions become important on these types of issues. If you're talking about intent or fairness or balancing, all that's important is that you use all the applicable facts and make your arguments. Your conclusion is not important. But when you're supposed to be working your way through this, it's sort of like, um, well, there's a math term. And I, and my students know I'm not good at math. Uh, an algorithm. If you work your way through the algorithm, you should come to a conclusion. And that conclusion should be correct. But I'll tell you one thing that you do have to do. When you sit down, the first thing you do is write out the statutory definitions of community property and separate property. Just get it out of the way. In fact, if you can get one of them rubber stamps made that has them on there, you just stamp it. You may also have to write out the statutory definition for quasi-community property, if it's applicable. Now, the other, the other piece of good news is that the community property bar exams are always similar in nature. They're asking you how to deal with a finite number of pieces of property, usually between three and five. And the only thing that changes is sometimes there are these little pre-issues that you have to get out of the way before you can start dealing with the individual pieces of property. We'll see something like that on our question today. But you're trying generally to do two things. Characterize the property. Give it an, you're, you're, you're characterizing it. And that characterization takes you through a few steps, okay? You look at the, the time it was acquired and the assets it, it was acquired with so you can tell under your statutory definitions, which you've written out, whether it's initially characterized as separate property or community property. That's your base. That's your, where you start from. Then you look to see if there's any presumptions or rules of law that change that characterization. Then you look to see if there's any actions or conduct by the parties that changes that characterization. Once you've worked your way through that little ladder of characterization issues, you will come to finally how it's characterized. And so your second major step will be 
to tell how it's distributed. The distribution rules in community property are generally fairly simple. It's the characterization that's the key. Now, under the time slash source section of your approach book, there is a series of little subjects that in my class I teach them, I, I call them special classification problems because what they are are items that are difficult to classify but have been dealt with either in statute or case law so now we have a specific set of rules for them. And I, I hesitated whether to go over these rules with you because I don't want to just sit up here and talk at you, but I've decided to go through some of them with you. And the reason is that these special classification problems have been tested on 12 of the last 20 bar exams, including every single bar exam or every single community property question from 91 to 98. So if you get a community property question, I can tell you almost for sure that you're going to have some major issues to deal with and you're going to have one of these annoying little special classification problems that you're going to have to handle. And I don't know what else to tell you that you have to know the rules for them. If you know the rules, they're easy. If you don't know the rules, you're done. The rules are fairly simple for most of them. And, and I'm going to try and give them to you as simply as I can. Personal injury awards. The classification generally depends on when the cause of action arises. And, and that means when was the injury inflicted. If it arises before marriage, recovery is treated as separate property. If it arises during marriage, recovery is treated as community property. Now this community property, there's just a couple, you know, there's just one little sort of kink in the road. It's called the divorce modification. So you've got this personal injury award, the cause of action arises during marriage, courts treated as community property. That divorce only, personal injury community property damages are awarded entirely to the injured spouse. Now, a little ad addendum to that is that if the community property damages are commingled with other community property, they lose their personal, their, their divorce modification status and are treated as community property. And of course, if the cause of action arises after permanent separation, California to treat, treats any recovery as separate property. Another little sub-issue, personal injury recoveries against the other spouse are always treated as the injured spouse's separate property. So if my wife wrecks the car on the way home and I'm injured, I get the money. The way she's driving up here, good possibility. Personal injury, out of all of these, personal injury is probably tested the most. Pensions. Pensions are retirement benefits whereby after you retire, the pension pays you a monthly amount based on a percentage of your final or highest salary. 
and the pensions are funded by some combination of employee salary deductions and employer contributions. The general rule is that pensions are classified as community property to the extent that the right to the benefits was earned during marriage. See how we're kind of following the same pattern? Regardless of when the benefits are actually paid. And actually, in, in other words, the benefits are considered deferred compensation. You're getting paid for something you earned earlier. So we have something called the time rule that says the valuation of pension earned both during and before after marriage. Courts multiply the present value of the pension. Okay, what's the value? Times a fraction. The total number of contribution years during marriage over the total number of contribution years. For example, if the present value of the pension is $100,000, the total number of contribution years during marriage is 10, the total number of contribution years overall is 20. Take that times that, and you should get 50K. Right? That's as good as my math gets. Disability benefits. Disability pay and workers' comp are treated the same, so we just call them disability benefits. As opposed to pensions, which are treated as deferred compensation, disability benefits are treated as wage replacement. In other words, they're designed to replace your regular earnings. So, the rule is, to the extent disability benefits are used to replace marital earnings, they're considered community property. To the extent they're used to replace separate post-divorce earnings, they're separate property. So you just need to ask yourself the question, these, this disability money, is it replacing community property earnings or separate property earnings? If you can answer that question, then you can characterize it. Life insurance proceeds. This can be difficult, but it doesn't have to be. At death, okay, when the proceeds are paid, they're community property in proportion to the percent of the premiums paid by the community. If the community paid half the premiums, it's entitled to half of the proceeds. At divorce, usually the only issue you're going to run into is the type of life insurance that has a, a cash value. To the extent that there is a cash value to the policy at divorce, it also is treated as community property to the proportion of the premiums paid by the community. I don't think you'll get a goodwill and business question, but if you do, understand that a company potentially has business goodwill, usually protected by trademarks. Okay? And Business goodwill really is simply calculated by taking the appraised total value of the company minus what its physical assets are. Whatever's left over is goodwill. And not surprisingly, business goodwill is community property to the extent that it's earned during marriage. Okay, last one. Education and training. I haven't seen much of this, but I always worry about it because it's a little more complicated than some of the other ones. The general rule is that 
the value provided by education and training is not community property. In other words, post-marriage earnings that are a result of pre-divorce education paid for community funds remain separate property. That doesn't seem fair, does it? However, there is reimbursement. At divorce, the community is entitled to reimbursement for interest for community funds that were, one, used to pay for education or training, or used to repay for a loan incurred for education or training, and two, the educational, education or training substantially enhanced the earning capacity of the educated or trained spouse. So the community gets reimbursement if the separate property education-y, God, is that a word? Um, has substantially increased earning capacity. Now notice I didn't say stab substantially increased earnings, I said substantially increased earning capacity. So if, if you want to take your law degree and go work at in and out you can do that, but your capacity has not been reduced. Your willpower is likely shot. <laughs> okay, now, if there's outstanding loans at divorce, those are assigned solely to the educated spouse at divorce. For premarital education, reimbursement is also available for premarital education when the community funds are used to pay off the educational loan. All right? So if you get your training before you get married, but you take out a loan, you get married, and the community pays, pays this loan off, you get reimbursement. Now, the last thing about reimbursement Watch out for an issue as to what exactly is reimburse reimbursable. In other words, what is an educational expense? I think it's clear that things like tuition, books, stuff like that is an educational expense. But I think it's arguable that living expenses are reimbursable. I used my student loan to buy a computer. I think that if, especially if the facts are such that someone is not working and going to school, that there are some living expenses that are arguably actually educational expenses. The community might be entitled to reimbursement of those. That is something that you'll just have to argue both sides. Okay, federal preemption, we just don't have time. Federal preemption is, the rules are very specific. You just have to know the rules, okay? On the question that we're going over tonight, there was an issue that was very tempting to claim federal preemption. But that's only if you kind of knew the rule. You just have to know the rules. Okay, let's talk about presumptions and rules of law that may change the character. The presumption that property acquired during marriage is community property can be rebutted by tracing. Okay, remember that changing the form of an asset does not change its character. If I take separate property funds and buy a car, and trade that car for a motorcycle during marriage, the motorcycle is separate property. If I can trace it from, what did I say, the money to the car to the motorcycle. Okay, that piece of property has changed form, but it hasn't changed character. Transmutation. 
can also change the character of property. That's an agreement between the parties to change the character of property. Before 1985, a transmutation could be shown by an oral agreement plus actions con conforming to that agreement. After 1985, it became much more difficult. You must show an express writing signed by the party whose interest is adversely affected. There is one exception to that. Spouses can give each other personal gifts of an insubstantial value. And the insubstantial value is in relation to what their standard of living is. So for example, if Kobe gives his wife a $4 million ring, that may not seem insubstantial to you, but it probably is to him. I think jewelry is a good example of this personal gifts exception. You don't have to have a, a transmutation. That ring is going to be considered her separate property, in my opinion. A third way you can change the presumptions is through antinuptial agreements. There are statutory sections for what can and can't be done in antinuptial agreements, but I can tell you they're largely enforceable. Um, there are also presumptions based on the form of title. You can look, the rules are fairly simple for joint tenancy and tenancy in common in the book. Um, now let's talk about what kinds of actions or conduct can change the character. And the question is, did either spouse act in a way that changes the character of the asset? Um, for example, commingling of funds. The book has a good section on bank accounts, but I want to talk to you about real property acquisitions because a very heavily tested area is in the area of what we call Lucas anti Lucas. And that's when you have separate property that is used to help pay for jointly titled community property. I'm not a huge believer at naming names on exams, but this is one that I would use. If you tell the examiner that you're talking about Lucas anti Lucas, they may not read the rest of your analysis. Here, here is the most simple Lucas anti Lucas analysis I can give you. It is easy. It's flat out easy. If you get a Lucas anti Lucas situation, you should throw your hat in the air. First of all, you identify that you have a Lucas anti Lucas issue. How do you do that? You look for joint title on a piece of property and some separate property contribution to that jointly titled property. Number two, decide which one applies, Lucas or anti-Lucas. If the marriage has been terminated by death of a spouse, Lucas always applies. The marriage has been terminated by divorce. Lucas applies to title taken before 1985. Anti-Lucas applies to title taken post-1985. Okay, now you know you have a Lucas-Anti-Lucas -Lucas issue. You know which one to apply. Step three is apply it. 
Lucas says the separate property contribution to the jointly titled property is presumed to be a gift. It can be rebutted by a showing that the parties agreed either orally or in writing that the separate property contribution would remain separate. If you can show that agreement, then the separate property and the community property have a proportional interest in it. They each have an interest proportional to their contribution to the purchase price. In anti-Lucas, we have a statute. What the statute says is that the separate property contribution is treated as community property. It's the same thing as saying it's a gift. So the separate property contribution is community property. That presumption can be rebutted by a showing in writing only that the separate property contribution would remain separate. And in that case, again, you have proportional interest. If you cannot show an agreement in writing that the separate property interest remains separate, the separate property is entitled to simple reimbursement. No interest, none of that nonsense. That's it. Okay, let's talk about when separate property is used to help pay for community property. Okay, and what I'm really talking about here is when you have, there are a lot of, this is called the more approach, and there are actually a lot of situations where this is sort of the default, the, the default characterization, because actually this more analysis applies any time that you find a separate property interest in community property. For example, let's say that you have separately titled property acquired during marriage and paid off with community property. Or you have untitled property acquired during marriage with mixed funds if the separate property can be traced. or you have property tiled in one spouse's name during marriage with mixed funds if no gift has been found, or you have, as in Lucas, jointly titled property where an agreement to preserve the separate property interest has been found. And that's going to give you a clue to what more is about because we've already talked about it. In those situations, the separate property and community property have an ownership interest in the appreciated value of the asset proportional to the payments made on the principal. Now, if separate property and community property split the purchase price 50-50, they're each entitled to half of the appreciated value. There are a lot of complex um, charts for more analysis, but if you break them all down, that's what they come down to. So in other words, to the proportion that the community paid for the asset, the community owns a proportion of appreciated value. There is no proportional interest for tax interest or insurance payments. 
Now, sort of a little sub-issue is that maybe, maybe separate property has been used to improve community property, like redecorate or something like that. In that case, the separate property is entitled to simple reimbursement. Okay. Let's talk about when community funds or labor are used to enhance the value, well, we've already talked about that when community is used to enhance the value of separate property, the community property is entitled to share that interest. But let's look at, where, at the specific example of where one spouse brings a separate property business into the marriage or uses separate property to start or buy a business, but then devotes his or her community labor to running the business. And this is usually entitled when community funds or labor is used to enhance a separate property business. In other words, contributes to the growth of the business. We have to figure out a way to, to apportion the separate property and community property interest in that business. Two methods are used. The Van Camp method and the Pereira method. Van Camp says that you value the manager's service at the going market salary and subtract the family expenses paid out for the business earnings from the business earnings to find the community property share. The remainder is separate property. So we take the market rate of managers services and we take that times the length the length of time that it was operated during marriage operated during marriage minus the family expenses paid out out of business earnings equals community property share. Does that make sense? Usually the math will be easy. It'll be something like ah, $10,000 a year for 10 years $100,000 minus the family expenses paid, community property share. Pereira says that you impute a fair rate of return on the separate property and by default that's generally 10% a year simple interest, current legal rate. Add that to the separate property principle, and that gets you the separate property share. The remainder is community property. So you take the principle, times the fair rate of return, usually 
times the number of years operated during marriage plus the principal equals separate property share. Okay, so let's say that, say this is $100,000 times 10%, that's $10,000 for 10 years, 20, add that again to the 100, or 200, 100, 10 times 10, 100, add 100 to 100, separate property shares 200. You're laughing at my math skills, aren't you? Okay, but does it make sense now? Yeah. If you've got 100 here, you take it times 10%, that gives you 10. Take it times 10 years, that gets it back up to 100. Add 100 to 100, and we get the separate property share. I'm, I'm, nobody here is worse at math than me. Okay? Don't make it harder than it is. The numbers you get will not be difficult. So how do you know which one to use? Well, on the bar exam, you know what? You're going to do both of them. You already know that. But I would also tell the examiner which one I think should be used. Use Van Camp when the character of the business itself is most responsible for the growth of the business. Okay. You know, you or, you, if you open a Krispy Kreme in the right spot, you know, Goofy could run it, and it's going to make money. Use Pereira when the management of the business by the spouse is most responsible for the growth of the business. Maybe you've got facts that, you know, somebody's run a business, was successful, sold it, started another business, was successful, sold it, and now is starting a third business. Okay? Those facts are going to tell me Pereira. Okay. There is um, there's reverse Pereira and Van Camp, but you just need to look at what's here. They're, 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 if you get this down, this stuff will be peanuts. Okay, but just be aware of it. Management and control of community property. Each spouse has exclusive management control over their own separate property. Each spouse has equal management control of community property. In other words, either a spouse's acting alone may buy, sell, spend, or encumber all of the community property. But there are some exceptions. You know, there's this issue of the gifts. The issue of gifts are surprisingly tested. And I'll, I'll tell you what's usually going on. One spouse may not make a gift of community property, and here we're really talking about personal property, without the written consent of the other spouse. However, a spouse may exchange, exchange community property for fair and reasonable value. So what you may run into is an issue. Quasi-community property is property that's treated as separate property until divorce or death. Then it's treated as community property. And for some reason, creditors can get it all quasi-community property too, although that is arguably unconstitutional. 
since it is treated as separate property until divorce or death. We will talk more about that. Now, there are these special rules for tort liability that are pretty important. There's an order of satisfaction. In other words, if there's some tort liability, is there a specific order that the creditors must, creditors must go after first? And the answer is maybe yes. If, and when we're talking about tort liability, we're talking about, you know, a husband or a wife did something wrong and now they owe some money for it, okay? If the defendant's spouse was performing an act for the benefit of the community when the liability arose, the judgment has to be satisfied first from the community property and second from the tortfeasor's separate property. If the tortfeasor spouse was not committing an act, in an activity for the benefit of the community when the tort liability arose, judgments are satisfied first from the tortfeasor's separate property and second from the community property. And that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if I'm doing something for the community and I get in a car wreck and someone gets hurt, then you know, the community pays first, then you can come after my separate property. Okay, now we're coming to, we made such a big deal over distribution. But the good news is, is that distribution is not a big deal. How does this stuff get distributed? Well, you know, the preliminary thing to say is that, you know, each spouse is separate property. Community property law doesn't have anything to do with that. That's not community property. We talk about separate property all night, but the fact is community property law doesn't have anything to do with it. You can do with your separate property whatever you want. But at divorce, community property gets split 50-50. If a spouse dies testate, then that, the, the, the deceased spouse um, is entitled to dispose of half of the community property by will. But if the spouse dies intestate, the survivor gets all of it. Quasi-community property we should talk about quickly. You know, quasi-community property is a little bit weird. It, it, don't try and make too much sense of it, okay, because it's strange. Um, the quasi-community property is defined as property acquired by either spouse that would have been community property had the couple been domiciled in California at the time of the acquisition. Okay, so they're married someplace else and they buy something and they move to California and you've got this something. Okay, a car, let's say. And the, um, you know, let's say that in this other state it's one of the spouses separate property. Okay, and when you but because they bought it during marriage, when they moved to California, it's still treated as separate property until death or divorce, 
but at death or divorce, it's generally treated as community property. But as we've noticed already, even though during the marriage it's treated as separate property, creditors can reach it as if it's community property already. Weird. Doesn't seem right. But those are the rules. Um, okay, last thing quickly. You may run into an issue of what we think of as common law marriage, unmarried cohabitants. California does not, let me put it another way. Courts in California have said that community property law in California does not apply to unmarried cohabitants. To be married in this state, you need to be you know, legally eligible as far as age and consent and all that stuff goes, but you also need a witness ceremony that's licensed and recorded to be validly married. But there's this issue of putative spouses. And putative spouse is, is, is really a simple issue, but it's very arguable, and I'll tell you why. To have the rights of a, as a putative spouse, you have to have an objective and subjective belief that you really are married. You know, and, and the way it might come up is something in the terms of, you know, a, a, a man and a woman are married and they get a divorce, but the divorce is defective. So this man thinks he's divorced, has every reason to believe he's divorced, but he's not really divorced, and he gets married again. He's not really married because he's not eligible to be married. Okay, no bigamy. During property acquired during that second marriage is called quasi-marital property, and it's treated like community property. In other words, if you can establish that you are a putative spouse, you essentially have all the rights of a real spouse. Okay. Um, okay. Let's um, let's take like seven minutes and get started again by at least a quarter till. That I've seen have to do with characterizing three or four, five pieces of property and then distributing them. This question asks you to do something at the beginning. Look, at there are a few things that when you encounter on a community property exam, it's best to deal with first so that you can get down to your regular characterization stuff. For example, maybe you have a prenuptial agreement that you have to figure out is valid or not because that potentially affects all following discussions of property. Or maybe you have an issue as to whether a marriage is valid or not, and if not, whether there's a putative spouse. If you're going to talk about community property, you really should establish whether there's a marriage or not first. See what I'm saying? Some of this stuff makes sense to go first. In this problem, we have an issue as to which pieces of property can we reach by the creditor? So it makes sense, although it's not entirely necessary, it makes sense from an organizational standpoint to figure out 
what property in what order can be reached by the creditor, and then decide what those are by characterizing each individual piece of property. Now, you don't have to do it that way, but what that saves you is after every characterization on a piece of property that you do, it saves you having to go through that discussion of whether the creditor can reach it or not. You don't have to keep going through that discussion over and over. What you can do is talk about what can the creditor reach in what order, characterize your property, and then conclude by saying, therefore, the creditor can reach this, this, and then this and this, but not this. Okay? So, let's try it that way. See if it makes sense. You'll see that the outline correctly starts out by defining community property, defining separate property. And also, I, I probably would have defined quasi-community property like right under there, boom, one, two, three. Because I know from reading the facts I've got quasi-community quasi -community property issues. So, we're working our way down through this sort of hierarchy of rules and when we're starting with creditors, we've got our own little hierarchy of rules. Our general rule regarding creditors. A creditor of one spouse can reach all the assets over which that spouse has the right of management and control. Which means that the creditor can reach all the community property, the debtor spouse's separate property, and the quasi-community property. All right, so now that we have the creditor rules, let's talk about the tort liability rules, because we have a special set of rules for those. Between Okay, the spouse is not liable for the tort debts of another, okay. Um, in, 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 in order of satisfaction between the community property and the tort fees or separate property, which we've already decided can be gotten at by the creditors, the order of satisfaction differs depending on whether the defendant was performing an act for the community when the liability arose. If the spouse was performing an act for the community, the judgment is satisfied first from the community property and then from that spouse's separate property. If not, it's first from the separate property, then for the community property. Now we have a, a little argument right off at the beginning. You know, you could say that going to this meeting was performing an act for the community. That's an argument. But the facts say that Harry strenuously opposed her going to the condo association meeting. Can't imagine why, but I think it's at least arguable that she was not performing an act for the community because she went unilaterally against her husband's wishes. I think there's arguments on both sides. And I'll, I'll tell you that, in my opinion, if you would have decided the different way, a different way on this issue, I don't think it would have cost you anything. Because all that's going to change once we decide this is at the end you're going to talk about which goes first and which doesn't. And I think that this issue is arguable. And I think it would have cost you if you wouldn't have talked about it but I don't think it would cost you if you decided that she was performing an act for the community. But, okay, let's assume that she wasn't. So, if she's not 
the judgment gets satisfied first from her separate property, then from community property. All right, see now we've got that out of the way. We've talked about what the creditor can get at and in what order it has to be got at. That grammar is terrible. Okay. So now we start characterizing. Hey, but the good news is because we've done this creditor analysis at the front, you know what we don't have to deal with at the end? Distribution. We're not talking about death or divorce here. So now we just have to characterize our individual pieces of property. This characterizing of individual pieces of property is something that has to be done on every single community property exam I've seen. Savings bonds. We're going to have one, two, three, four basic discussions. We're going to start with the savings bonds. Okay. You know, they did something a little weird here. They're making us double up on this tort fees or liability thing here. And if you didn't know those tort rules, this was a bad question for you. The savings bonds that Wendy bought were paid for out of her tort settlement. Okay, Carrie was the tort feeser. Under California law, as we've seen, a judgment received from a third party for a tort committed during the marriage's community property. However, a tort judgment by one spouse against the other spouse is the non-tort feasor's separate property. And since she bought the savings bonds front with that separate property, tracing tells us separate property. Okay, so we've got um, Savings bonds, went, went, Wendy's, Wendy's separate property. Okay, all you needed to know was the tort fees and rules, but there was that little one that you really needed to know. If I get my money because I'm injured because of my spouse's tort, that money's mine, even though the cause of action arose during marriage. Stock portfolio. Henry purchased the stocks from his earnings at the time they were residing outside of California in state X. Under the state law, the stock would be treated as Harry's separate property. Now, this is quasi-community property. If they would have bought it when they were residing in California, it would be community property. So it's, it's property that is treated as separate property when they move to California, but treated as community property upon dissolution or divorce. But courts have found that as far as creditors concerned, it's treated as community property. And now, this outline did exactly what I would have done. I would have made the argument that that's unconstitutional. Okay? My argument is that since it's treated as separate property until due solution or divorce, I have a vested right in it. You cannot take away my vested right in my separate property to satisfy the debtor of somebody else. By the way, I agree with that, just so you know. But um, but it's a losing argument, but I'm going to make it anyway because I think there's points there. Maybe there's not, but it's going to take me, I don't know, three, four minutes to make that argument. I'm going to take a chance 
and make that argument, but I'm going to be sure to make it succinctly. I'm scared. <laughs> Something's going to bust through that wall. <laughs> okay. The, the condominium. Um, let me point out a couple things. Um, first of all, if you, I'm going to back up just a second. If you wanted to go into federal preemption for the savings bond, they were probably trying to make you do that. But I'm not going to tell you, but do yourself a favor. Read up on what the rule for federal preemption of savings bonds really is and show yourself why it didn't apply to this. It'll give you an idea of the reason you need to know what the rules for the savings bonds are or the things like that, those special classification problems that I talked to you about. Um, all right, condominium. We've got Harry and Wendy buying a house in California, jointly titled, using separate property funds. What issue is this? Lucas anti Lucas. This is in, it happened in 1980. That's before 1985. Actually, the year the Lucas case came down. So, we've identified our Lucas anti Lucas issue because we found separate property contribution to jointly titled property. We've decided which one applies. Is there any evidence of an agreement that the property remain separate property? No. Therefore, under Lucas, the property is presumed to be a gift. Oh, we got stock portfolio, which we found to be community property, although it's really quasi. We have the condo. Except community property. Auto repair business. Okay, the money started. Yes. <coughs> because it's joint. <coughs> It's jointly titled property, okay? When you've got jointly titled property, okay, you're starting off under Lucas with the presumption that it's community property and that the separate property contribution is presumed to be a gift. Lucas and anti Lucas apply to all forms of joint title. Okay, um, we start off with this inheritance. Inheritance is what? Separate property, that's exactly right. Um, he bought the business with his inheritance. Simple tracing tells us that it's separate property. Now, here's our, this is going to be Van Camp Pereira, I can tell already. When a spouse uses community property assets, to contribute to a separate property business, the community has an interest in the appreciation during the business of the marriage. Depending on what formula the court uses will depend on the allocation, in other words, the division between separate property and community property. Now, 
here's the thing, we don't have any numbers. So we don't have to do any math. What we do have to do is accurately state what the two accounting methods are. And then we can simply say, we know that a portion will be separate property and a portion will be community property, but we don't know what portion. Auto business. It's going to be some Okay, there's our characterization. Wendy separate property, community property, community property, some husband separate property, some community property. So, the final thing that I'm going to put on my answer is here's the order that the creditor can collect on. First of all, the savings bond is the white separate property. Second of all, the stock portfolio, the condo, and the community property portion of the business. The creditor cannot get at the husband's separate property. Yes, because the thing is, is that, you know, the creditor's rights are a little funky, and, and it is true that, for example, in the case, there are certain situations in community property law, quasi-community property being a perfect example, where property is treated one way during the marriage and a different way at dissolution or divorce, but unless it's one of those situations, you can... You, you need to look at it as if we're talking about dissolution or divorce right now. In other words, this is the current state of the property. That's why I'm saying this community property rule for creditors, or quasi-community property rule for creditors, is not fair. Because what's the use of treating quasi-community property as one spouse's separate property during marriage and then a different way at divorce or dissolution if you're going to pretend it's community property when a creditor wants to get at it. We haven't had divorce or dissolution yet. That's why that bothers me for exactly that reason. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing you. Why don't we do this? Anybody who wants to ask questions, why don't you come on up, sir, and, and we'll talk about it. Is that all right? I'm having trouble hearing you. Just come on. I, I, I'm, if everybody wants to stay, they can, but I'm assuming some people would like to go. What's that? <laughs> yeah, I've been a teacher a little while. So anybody with questions, please, you're welcome to come up. I can stay for a while.